Uh, let's start our uh, session. So we we'll have a very nice session. We we'll have three speakers. All of them are in the audience. So I'm here, even though they, they say that they cannot see with their backs, and so they're in the audience. So uh, we have 15 minutes for each talk, and then uh, we don't have discussion, but uh, hopefully we'll have a long discussion of about 15 minutes per paper as well. Okay, so um, let us start. So the first presenter is Konstantin Sonin. I guess most of you, all of you know him. Uh, and it's a paper on, uh, well, you see the title. So Costa, the floor is yours. Okay, thank, uh, thanks, Misha. This is a joint work with Darona Simoglu from MIT and Georgi Yegorov, who is at Northwestern, and this is a paper about um, Alexis de Tocqueville hypothesis that links social mobility and stability of democracy. So uh, I'll start um, with a bit, very big question, and then we'll um, provide our very big answer uh, to this big question. The big question is what makes democracy stable, and stable in the sense that uh, sometimes you could imagine circumstances, and I'll show you that there are such circumstances in which um, the current decision maker, the median voter in the democratic uh, situation, would want to abandon democracy. So, initial question: Why? Uh, initial question is why some democracies are uh, historically very stable. And one answer to this uh, question is that some democracies are stable basically because, uh, basically because. Uh, the societies in which they operate, they're very homogeneous. And when uh, you have a homogeneous society, then it does not matter who makes the decision. So there is no reason to disenfranchise a part of the population because disenfranchised part will, the enfranchised part will make the same decision as the, um, as the whole society. But then there is at least one example of a country that has a stable democracy for almost 200 years, and at the same time, have a very high heter heterogeneity in terms of income and wealth. That's the United States. So there is a big question why democracy was uh, has been so, so stable in the United States. And one answer given by Alexis, Alexis de Tocqueville back um, 200 years ago was that social mobility is one of the reasons why you could have a stable democracy in a highly heterogeneous society. So uh, actually, um, when I was in high school, I read the talk with the talk with democracy in America and found it very, very difficult to understand. Then, when I was uh, writing this paper, I reread what the talk wrote, and again, I <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Uh, it, it's very hard to understand what he's talking about. But uh, frankly, they were extremely uh, clear, much more clever than me, people like Wilfredo Pareto and uh, Seymour Lipset and ben Bennington Moore who read the Tocqueville and formulated the, the Tocqueville hypothesis that relates social mobility and the stability of democracy the way I formulated it. That the social mobility is something that makes uh, a democracy stable in a heterogeneous, heterogeneous society. So there are, these are the words from the Tocqueville from which clever people read what I told you. So, um, th th this relates to a major topic of our mm, recent work. We are basically interested in institutional stability. Democracy might be unstable for several reasons. There might be a revolution by poor, there might be a coup by rich. But in this paper, we focus on the situation where the current decision maker, the median voter under democracy, dismantles democratic institutions. So I'll start, and basically I will, this will be the, the central part of my presentation. I will show you a simple two-period example, uh, which basically carries uh, most of the insights that we have in our general model. So this is a very simple example, and the whole paper is um, basically an extension, an, an extension of this example to the general case. So we have a society of n individuals. Uh, there is a unidim unidimensional policy space. This is uh, the utility functions, and these are going to be stage payoffs of the of the individuals. So each period there is some policy, and uh, the utility of each individual depends on this policy and the ideal point of this individual. So these are 
ideal points. This this is the current um, uh, the current policy, and the society is uh, is as follows: forty percent of the society are rich, twenty percent, and and the rich has a have the ideal point of one. Uh, twenty percent of the society. Uh, are middle class and the ideal point is zero and 40 percent of the society are poor and their ideal point is minus one and there, there might be three types of um, uh, of political institutions in this society there might be a left-wing dictatorship where when the poor make the decision there might be democracy so every, everybody votes and in the, the society composed like this obviously the middle class is going to make decisions under uh, under democracy because the median voter will belong to the middle class and there might be uh, the elite dictatorships when the rich makes uh, m uh, makes decisions so in our model there will be um, policy decisions made by the current decision maker and there will be a policy decision and there will be a decision on who is going to be the decision maker in the next period so we are always talking about uh, these two decisions. And we'll, we start with a two-period model. So suppose that we have only two periods, there is no discounting. Uh, so the, the current decision maker, the initial decision maker, he chooses policy for the first period and decides who makes the policy in the second period. And in the second period, uh, the new decision maker only makes the policy decision because there is, uh, th this is the end of it. So what we what we could see in the two-period example. First, if we start with the rich in power and there is no social mobility, then uh, the elite dictatorship persists. There is no reason for the rich to pass power to the middle class or to the poor. Now, suppose that we have uh, the rich are in power and we have full social mobility, full in, in the following sense. With equal probability, each of the members of the society ends up in a um, in the shoes of another individual in the next period. So you know now that next period you are going to be uh, with probability 0 0.4 poor, the probability 0 0.4 rich, and, pro and 0 0.2 uh, middle class. So this this is as close to the model of full total social mobility as we, as we could. Mm -hmm. Then, with the assumptions that I make, the rich will transfer the power. They will make the policy, the policy choice in the first period and then transfer the power to the middle class. Basically because on average, if, if you are rich now, you know that on average you are going to be in the middle class in the next period. At the same time, if the initial, the initial uh, policy institutions policy institution is democracy, then it persists. Because if you're in the middle class, uh, then uh, on average you are still in the middle class in the next period, so there is no reason to transfer the power. So here, in this very simple example, the data quill hypothesis um, holds. So now, uh, let us modify this example a little bit. Starting with the middle class in power, and there is only partial social mobility. And the partial social mobility is as follows. After the first period, uh, there is a certain number of members, uh, our members of the middle class become rich. And then we could analyze again the same game, and then it happens that if the uh, number of members, the number of members who are middle, who are moved from middle class to the rich is large enough, then, even if the decision make, if, even if the middle class makes decisions in the first period, they are going to transfer power to the rich for the next period. Basically, if you are, if you are likely to end up in the rich in the next period, then now you transfer the power for the second period to the rich. And otherwise, if this social mobility is slow enough, then democracy, then democracy persists. So al already in this very simple example, we see the a limitation to the data quill hy hypothesis. So we see that a partial mobility, mobility that affects only a part of the society, might actually be detrimental to democracy. So if we have a, have a society 
then something, a technological shock, or I don't know, a new educational policy affects uh, the mobility between the middle class and the rich, this might be detrimental to, uh, to democracy. Now, let me uh, make the whole story a little bit more, more interesting. Again, same setting, uh, the same composition of the society, the same ideal point. Does it work the other way around? So if the hard proportion of the middle class is expected to become poor, then you turn to a left-wing yeah. condition? Yeah, sure. Yes. Um, um, so the same setting, the infinite uh, number of periods, and each period our members of the middle class become rich, same number of rich becomes middle class. So in, 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 in this paper we always, we always keep the composition of the sizes of classes fixed. So when we talk about social mobility, this means that people move from a class to class, from a class to a class, but they do not uh, affect the size, size of classes. Now with infinite periods, uh, we need to have a discount factor. Let it be four fifths. Now and let um, let examine stability of democracy in this case. First, note that left wing dictatorship persists, and an elite dictatorship persists. Um, now, what happens if we start with democracy? If mobility, if the social mobility is high, if the number of people who move from the middle class to the um, rich class is large enough, then democracy is abundant in the uh, in the first period. But this is a kind of this is uh, what could be seen from the two two period example. Now there is something that cannot be seen from the two period example. Suppose that mobility is low, very few, very few members of the middle class become rich, then still democracy might be, uh, might be unstable in the infinite period example. And for the following, uh, for the following, actually I added six. <laughs> My watch, My watch is show six minutes. So, uh, now, um, so what happens with democracy of mobility? is low, uh, then um, the middle class obviously prefers democracy in, in the next period because um, there is a very small probability that you are going to be uh, not in the middle class in the next period. But, but also the middle class pre prefers elite dictatorship in the distant future because over the infinite number of periods each citizen of the middle class is going to spend two thirds of uh, the time as being rich and one third of being poor. That's called uh, the ergodic property of Markov chains. If the mobility between the middle class and the rich is uh, non-zero, it's, it's positive, then even if it's very, very slow, still this is true. You will still spend two thirds of the time as rich and one third of the time as poor in expectation. So in equilibrium, we will have the station when mobility is very slow, then democracy persists, but when uh, the mobility is slow, but not very slow, then there are only mixed strategy equilibrium because of these two things, because the middle class prefers democracy in the next period, but also prefers elite dictatorship over the long run. This means that you, you need optimally to abandon, uh, to abandon uh, democracy with a positive probability uh, in each period. There is, of course, a huge a huge literature that we build on. And the main results of our paper are uh, existence of equilibrium in a general setup. It's going to we focus on mark of perfect uh, symmetric equilibrium. We examine conditions for uniqueness. And there is a very interesting political economy uh, of voting between, between future selves of the same person. Because in a model with social mobility, you know that your preferences tomorrow might be different from your preferences today. So to have a unique equilibrium, you need to impose a joint condition on the preferences of your future self. So in a sense, you have a voting between, um, between future, future, uh, future selves of the same, of the same uh, person. We examine stability and asymptotic stability of this model. Basically, you will have the results similar to what I, I've shown you uh, in this example, one thing, one thing that 
our model allows us to get is the following. So throughout the paper, we take social mobility as exogenous. So it's always um, something which is taken by uh, the agents for granted. But now, assume that we could step back and ask the members of the society what level of the social mobility they would prefer. So what? W let me go through the argument in form. So who benefits from uh, the mobility between the middle class and the rich? So look at the rich. The one thing they can lose because they can become poor, the higher is the, the mobility between the middle class and the rich, the higher chances for the rich that they get poorer as a result. But at the same time, as our model shows, uh, you might benefit from higher mobility between the middle class and the rich because the political power will be moved from the middle class to, to the rich as a result of this mobility. Of course, the middle class, the middle class uh, can only become richer because of the mobility between the middle class and the middle class and uh, the rich so they totally better off. And poor, they can lose, which is a kind of a new, I think it's a kind of, at least theoretically, it's a kind of a new insight that poor can lose because of the social mobility between the middle class, the middle class and the rich, although the social mobility doesn't affect them. And they may lose because of the high social mobility, uh, the um, <coughs> political power is more likely to be moved from the middle class to the rich, so further away from the poor's ideal point. So they're going to lose because of the high social mobility, although this social mobility doesn't affect affect them at all. So one thing that our model contributes to the political economy that we we have in this model a very natural coalition between between the rich and the poor against against the middle class. So basically, you could get uh, for a range of parameters an equilibrium where the rich and the poor, they vote jointly against the preferences of the middle class over the level of social mobility. So I think I have about one minute. So our answer about what makes democracy stable is as follows. It basically, Alexis de Tocqueville had gotten something right that Indeed, high social mobility might make democracy might, might make democracy more stable, but at the same time, he overlooked um, such important things as that a partial social mobility, a social mobility that affects only part of the society, could make democracy less stable. In our model, the dynam dynamics of institution is driven because the decision makers care about future selves, and. Uh, um, our model also has uh, some interesting features. For example, I haven't mentioned this, but uh, as always, an equilibrium could be supported by slippery slope considerations. But typically in a political economy, in poli typically in models of voting, these slippery slope considerations arise only for intermediate discount, of only for high discount factors. And in this model, they cannot arise for high discount factor, but only for intermediate discount factor. Thank you very much. So now questions, John. So I have uh, two quick technical questions and then a empirical comment. The technical ones is, you rule out the case in which the distribution of income affects the growth rate of all of them, right? So the yes. poor, so there might be a situation under which the poor would prefer the rich to be richer if they would become poorer even if they stay poor. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. We do not rule out this. We would obviously want to uh, extend our results to the stuff that you described, but we have not done it yet, and it might be a kind of difficult. We already have a lot of technical difficulties dealing with this very simple, very simple. So the other one is a simple modification. Can you put diminishing marginal utility of money and see how that affects it? Oh. In principle, yes. yes. How to do it uh, right in this model? You it's, 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 it's not very. 
Yeah, I, I, dis, I, I, no, dis, I, I understand, but this might not be this might not be easy. Okay. Now the other empirical comment I have is: Do you know Greg Clark's work? No. So he has this book. You would probably find interesting. The sun also rises, and he claims that most discussions of social mobility make two mistakes. One is they overemphasize the dollar social mobility instead of social status. And the other one is that they tend to look at, say, individual families rather than groups of families because it ignores clan regression to the mean. And when Greg Clark studied persistence of elites in the US, the UK, Sweden, and China, the persistence of the elites is the same across over 100 years. In England's case, over 400 years. Yeah, actually, I think I, I, I read this. Right? I, so I, I, the, I know this and, yeah. So for instance, the example he uses in England is that the parliament had a huge reform, right, where they made the House of Lords weak and replaced the Labour with the House of uh, Labour, uh, right, or Commons, which overnight led to the Labour Party. So you would think that displaced the elites. But Clark points out that almost all the leaders of the Labour Party who came into power, or out of power, they never had nothing, were relatives of no. the elites of 50 or 100 years earlier, just as the Bolsheviks were often disproportionately tied to intellectuals or urban elites or things like that, relative to we we're going but to study this more soon. Helmut Stalin disposed most of the intellectual Bolsheviks in favor of uh, Bolsheviks with much more humble origins. Well, we're going to see. We're going to like to look at this. Because in China they did it in the, in, in the cultural no, I, 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 I pretty, I'm pretty sure that the origins of the Politburo members after, after Stalin and in the 70s and 80s were extremely humble. I, I remember I remember looking at the biographies of the Politburo members when I was a school kid in the 80s, and not a single of them was born in a, any kind of town, not oh, a city. They, they were all from small small villages. So, uh, uh, I mean... All, all I'm saying is when you look at China, which had more dramatic uh, cultural revolution, Beijing University doesn't change very much in terms of admissions, in terms of the percentage of rare elites. Anyway, but I just I mentioned that. Uh, more questions? I guess I have a question about how you would map this model, which is simply a metaphor, to what's happening in uh, real institutional change settings. Because um, essentially, why would a politician or decision maker care about so further in the uh, far in the, the future well, what's going to happen? So, are you sort of assuming? An altruistic motive towards no, I, no. I, I actually think that infinite, uh, infinite period model is a very kind of innocuous thing and a very realistic thing, because basically when you um, have a game, and if you assume that there is a finite number of periods, then the fact that there is a the last period, this puts a lot of. Um, I mean, the effect of this is typically very large relative to all other effects in the model. So I always think about infinite period model is just a more realistic uh, realistic model of uh, or ordinary lives. Because if you just uh, survive to the next period uh, with, a certain with a certain probability, which is less than one, uh, and all of us actually survive in the next period with probability slightly less than one, then means that you actually perceive this as a like infinite period game with this survival probability. So uh, I, I would not, I would not think that this is uh, this is a big limitation relative to realism. There are other obviously big limitations to the, uh, right. the realism of this model. Is there any empirical study that actually no, no, tests no. these predictions yet? Or are you intending to do that? I mean, since you can calibrate easily, because it's, there are very few parameters here. Yeah, we, we could calibrate, uh, but I, I'm, I'm a kind of, I'm not sh I, I, it's not always the, the case when you calibrate something, that you make your um, theory more reality related. I think it's um, it's a kind of it, that's a very difficult question, I would say. If I but you're aware know of the, the PO, POUM hypothesis, right? So prospects of yep, yep, yeah. so 
what actually, you're doing the, is essentially very similar in way, right? You know, um, so there is, I, I know one good model, Benabu and Hoc yeah. model of um, hypothesis. Like they, this is basically a two-period, uh, two-period model of um, of our case. So one thing that we show is that uh, their model is very um, kind of. Um, it's not robust to the assumption of these infin in infinite periods. You would have very different predictions if you abandon these two, two, period, uh, two period restrictions. I, I, I think that if we want to draw some, something about the real world about this model, then we need to properly interpret what does it mean to disenfranchise, to disenfranchise a part of the population. And I thought that if you think about the changing role of money in elections, then this might relate to our uh, our degrees of disenfranchisement. Basically, um, and then you will have a, you will have map our story to what happened in the United States in the last 30 years because you see lower social mobility by any, any measure. You uh, you see lower social mobility and you see. If this interpretation about the role of money is correct, the gradual disenfranchisement of the of the poor relative to the uh, to the rich. Yes, please. Uh, just related to your last remark, and also to what you mentioned at the very beginning, that you believe that in the United States the uh, democracy is pretty stable as far as that is uh, How your uh, model could be explanation or to a certain extent, uh, how, to explain, how to explain this phenomenon, and also, the second question, uh, which kind of voting rules do you consider? Because, you know, in the United States, the uh, elections are different in many different um, areas, and uh, the president is one thing, the uh, senators and the House of Representatives is different, and so on. Is there any effect for that, or it's... Um, but basically, you know, could you just uh, explain in terms of the uh, conclusions that you come up with? Um, what's going on over there, and to what extent is uh, confirmed that you know, in such a country like the US, it should be considered this but Basically, this is a, a very general model. So they uh, just have uh, majority voting. We could extend this to the case when they have uh, weighted majority, uh, weighted majority voting, but this is still a very stylized, uh, stylized um, voting environment. So it, of course, doesn't take into account the specifics of um, political system in the United States. Basically, I think, uh, as related to the stability of the United States political system, it's just uh, what we do here is just the uh, demonstration that uh, the Tocqueville hypothesis could work in a formal setup that you could have stable democracy in a highly heterogeneous society, uh, and this stability is um, self-supported because of the of high social mobility. Um, because historically, historically, the United States have high social mobility, and still they, in a sense, have high social social mobility. They have very persistent elites. But if you look at the probabilities probabilities of a very rich uh, a, a very poor person or a kid of a very poor people to become very rich, these probabilities are still enormously high relative to other uh, countries uh, countries in the world, at least other developed developed countries. So basically our model say only very general things about the United States experience. But more questions? I want to ask a question. So, in the general model, do you allow the class sizes to change? Oh, um, we, don't, we don't know how to do how to do this. Um, but if I mean, if, if we allow only for a finite number of changes of size of classes, then we could do all of these analysis for this case. But if there might be an infinite number of changes to the class sizes. No, our model. We, we don't know how to make our model work. We do not know how to solve for 
an equilibrium. And if we would have solved for an equilibrium, we don't know whether it is going to look like what we have or to be completely different. So we just don't know. Two more questions, and I guess then we will need to go to the next presentation. Can I follow up on that? And would it, can you deal, or are you planning to deal with the issue in which the elites can figure out this model? So they will have an incentive to adjust the size of the polity. So the extreme case of that is that Malaya was broken up into Singapore. Singapore was made independent, not to help Singapore, but because the Malaysians didn't want a society to be heavily Chinese. So Singapore was pushed off separately from Malaysia, Malaya, and Malaysia became an independent, a separate country. So you could argue that's a kind of they're doing backwards mm -hmm. induction. In, yeah, in, in at least partially we account for this, because in this model you could disenfranchise a certain group of population. You could vote, or the current decision maker could make this decision and disenfranchise a part of the population. So this is uh, this is account, accounted for. But if you if you talk about changes in the sizes of classes, so for example, we have a classes by wealth, and then you exclude all Chinese people. So this is something that is um, kind of not uh, fully correlated with, the, with wealth. No, we don't know how to do this, but this is a very interesting question. And the last question. So, so when I think about social mobility, I think about it in a intergenerational way. Hey, you don't have classes having children, right? So uh, you think about your, you know, you're discounting your future. So I can think about sort of me in the future having my children and then a game. Would anything change if you allowed them to have children? And would anything change if you allowed them to have children across different classes? Mm. I mean, it, technically, that will depend on what you assume about these children. If the, ch is, if the children are Gen generated by some process which reproduces the class structure of the society, then no problem, it's going to be the same. If it is uh, one thing that we focus on more perfect equilibrium, so history doesn't matter, so it doesn't matter whether you are a son of someone with the same wealth or you are just the same person. If uh, the, the children are generated by some skewed process, then, I don't know, my, my, uh, the results might be very different from what we have. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, we can continue the discussion after the session.